reclaim the land and then put up something. How do you value things like that? I mean, is that property to start off with? Do you call that land? And you're saying the IFRS is getting complicated. Anyway, besides the point. I mean, we had massive, massive issues on investment property. We still do. IFRS, our IS40 says, you can move from a cost basis of measuring investment property to fair value, but you cannot change your accounting policy from fair value to cost. In fact, the wording in the standard says, it's highly unlikely that you can justify that a move from fair value to cost will result in better presentation. Guess what clients do? They come to us and say, the, the standard says highly unlikely. It doesn't say no. <laughs> but the reality is, the reality. I mean, fair value is there. If the fair value has gone down, that is the reality. That is the reality. And this is what clients were fighting about. There were other issues we've had. We've, uh, we've had other issues with investment property. For example, the standard changed mid midway. Before we had IS40 saying that when you have investment property during construction, you would treat it as property, plant, and equipment. However, this, there was an improvement to the standard which says, wait a minute, investment property during construction should be investment property. Why do you want to treat it as property, plant, and equipment? Now, the amount of chaos this little concept created, because now how do you measure some, at fair value something that's not done? Because typically people would measure fair value of investment property at discounted future rentals. Now, if something is not complete, how do you get discounted future rentals? And the standard specifically says you do not take into account future capital expenditure. So how do you, you, do you assume the thing is complete? How do you can't do that? For practical purposes, we allowed that. We said, okay, listen, the only way to fair value this in construction property, investment property, is wait, assume what the cost to complete would be. You know this. Look at the future discounted rentals. And this is a practical expedient to get fair value of investment property. So that was one issue we faced. We're still facing it today. I face this in Jordan, Syria, Yemen. <laughs> Believe it or not, we have problems on investment property and its valuation. There was another problem that existed for many, many years. And I'm going to use EMAR as an example. Purely as an example, what I'm going to be discussing with you is publicly available information. So it's nothing confidential or anything of that sort. EMAR is a pro, was a property developer. They were responsible for building the world's, what is currently the world's tallest tower. Now that world's tallest tower has residences in it. It has offices, whatever the case may be. In Dubai, you could have bought an apartment in the Burj Khalifa, or Burj Dubai as it was called that time. Imar would be building the tower. Now the big question that all developers in that part of the world faced was, listen, is this construction contract where I can recognize revenue on a percentage completion basis. That means as EMAR is laying the bricks, they will recognize revenue. Or am I selling you a completed good? Now, the way clients would look at this typically is saying, wait a minute, we have the activity of construction. Therefore, this must be a construction contract. But that's not the way IFRS works. It says, what is your promise to your customer? Or what is the nature of your contract with the customer? If your nature of your contract or the customer is a construction contract, regardless of your activity, then only you can have construction accounting. If the nature of your contract is a sale of goods, then you, can rec then you have to apply IS-18. You cannot recognize revenue as you are laying bricks. You only recognize revenue when you deliver goods, which is when you give the person the key. Now, we had lots of issues around this. IFRIC 15 sorted a lot out. I mean, generally, companies have to see whether they're acting as, as construction companies. If you can get rid of EMAR, then it's a construction contract. If you can specify major structural elements of design, then it's a construction contract. But guess what? The only thing they allowed you to specify was what color tiles you wanted. <laughs> That's not a major structural element of design. So what we notice is lots of developers would have liked to use IS11 for their developments. But the reality is 
It wasn't a construction contract. Yes, the activity of construction is happening in the background, but the reality is you are selling a good. And when you sell goods, you know normal trade sale, you recognize revenue when you transfer risk and rewards, and that's normally when you deliver the key. Difficult issue, controversial issue, EMAR had to change the accounting policy. They were recognizing revenue on a percentage completion basis for many, many years. When they were building the Burj Khalifa, a year or two before handover, they had to change their policy because F-15 clarifies the position. Impairment. Financial instruments. Now, this is very, very interesting. Lots of people would have had shares. They would have shares in various companies. We had clients who bought shares in 2008 in Citibank at $40 a share. Year-end price, $3.50. If that is not an impairment, I don't know what is. All right. I mean, the standard wasn't cleverly worded. Does the decline or to book an impairment on a share, you need a significant or prolonged decline. What is significant? Goodness, how, there's no word in the standard or there's no explanation of what is significant. A significant or prolonged. It's not significant and prolonged. But what the reality was is, listen, if share prices have dropped so much, and there still is an active market and that share price is real, you have to book a loss on that. You can't say the market is wrong if there is an active market. Yes, the treatment under available for sale is unfair. I remember you mentioning it before, that you saying this is a very, very unfair treatment. And I agree it is an unfair treatment, but it is a treatment that exists. You know, one of the Saudi CFOs asked, I was sitting on a panel, and they asked the question to Paul. Paul, if you had to rewrite the standard IS-39 again, would you have changed that requirement to significant and prolonged rather than significant or prolonged? Paul Pector said, if we had to rewrite the standard, we wouldn't have available for sale. Available for sale as a category was an abomination. I cannot justify it to you on any conceptual basis. I can't. It doesn't make sense. Investment property book to the income statement. However, available for sale sits there in equity. The other guy who decided not to categorize that as available for sale and designates it at fair value, hits, gets the hit in the income statement and the hit is then affecting earnings per share. The other guy who's putting it in available for sale is sparking away gains and losses in equity and insulating his EPS number. You know, that's why for some reason we have this statement of comprehensive income that doesn't end with profit. It wants you as a user to see the guy who's put the same share, Citibank share, at fair value through profit or loss and be able to compare him with the guy who's put it as available for sale. So you, if you're a clever analyst, you can do the adjustment or do the sums yourself. But anyway, financial instruments were impaired. I mean, people can't argue that the market was not impaired. If you didn't book an impairment in 2008 or 2009, I don't think you ever will. <laughs> All right, that's the reality on shares. Paid loans. Paid loans is also another reality. I mean, we had massive, massive collapses in the Gulf. Saad and Guseb group, a strong group in Saudi Arabia, had massive exposure to various banks across the region, went down. Nahil, a company that was seemingly very, very strong. I mean, when, when banks were providing funding to Nahil, at the back of their mind, this is government debt. Therefore, it is secure. What emerged is that it wasn't. And, and the funny thing, and the lesson that we learned in Dubai, or that the banks learned in Dubai, is name lending isn't good. <laughs> Don't lend to somebody because he is from a reputable family. Use the fundamentals, credit risk. Does he have the ability to pay? Is there sufficient collateral? And that's a reality we're still facing. People are trying to deny the fact that impairment exists on things. Sometimes for strong political reasons, they don't want to say, wait a minute, Nahil is government, let's not impair it. You know, it will cause catastrophe in the country. That's the realities we face. The central bank would sometimes say, hey guys, you know, we know it's an impairment for accounting purposes. Can't you structure it in a way that they don't have impairment? 
and we step back and saying, listen, accounting follows reality.